Ian, the relationship between science and theology has become an important topic, not only in the in intellectual world, but actually in public consciousness. To a large degree, this is the result of your pioneering efforts. I would love to hear your reflections on the contemporary history of science and theology. Well, I think there has been a lot of, uh, of growing interest. Uh, I, I started off as a scientist and uh, then only later got interested in ethical questions arising from science. That's one area that's been quite important. I think a lot of people realize that science in its applications uh, raises ethical questions which science itself can't answer how you use the science. Uh, but also I think that the sort of challenge to religious faith that science has presented. Uh, in my own case I started with a PhD in physics and then uh, later decided to study theology and philosophy and then wanted to first fit these two halves of myself together yeah. but found a lot of other people were interested in this kind of thing too and uh, there are there are um, a few issues that keep bubbling up evolution obviously that has been a, a focus of attention but there are a lot of other ones the Big Bang and astronomy I think there are a few important questions that have uh, evoked a, a widespread and discussion. it's growing these things uh, these questions often appear on the front pages of newspapers mm -hmm. today as we discover new information whether about evolution or about cosmology origins mm -hmm. and ends of humanity's place mm -hmm. and things and mm -hmm. science and theology this uh, this nexus is really the place uh, where we explore uh, our own reality mm -hmm. well I think the uh, the popular media has tended to stress the two extremes, the, the people who believe in God but not evolution, and the people who believe in evolution but not God, and tend to leave out uh, this middle ground of people who believe in both God evolution, let's say, and uh, maybe see evolution as God's way of creating. And I think that's been the area I've been particularly interested in exploring. Let's go back and look at science and religion as you, as you have so marvelously. Uh, from a methodological point of view, what is the underlying thinking behind science and religion, and how do we contrast them? Well, I think they're different enter enterprises, and you've got to start by saying they're not the same. Uh, there's a kind of testability uh, about scientific theories, never certainty, but uh, and always revisability, but a, a degree of confidence uh, that you can't get about uh, religious ideas. Uh, I think you, they ask different kinds of questions, really, questions of why things are as they are, as against how they develop. Uh, but I think there are, there are, you can see some similarities. Uh, I think uh, the role of uh, imaginative models in both areas when you're dealing with something you can't observe directly maybe it's an electron in science uh, God in uh, realm of religion uh, you have to use imaginative models that don't completely grasp in either case the full reality but are your attempt to visualize what may be going on uh, this is this is particularly fascinating yeah. imaginative models because in both cases are our senses cannot apprehend what we want to right. investigate. Right. So let, let's dig a little deeper on that. H how might these imaginative models work for an electron and how might they work for God? Well, in, in physics, you used to think it was just a little electron going around, around mm -hmm. a, a nucleus, whereas now you have to imagine a, a kind of a wave structure that in a way is beyond imagination. Uh, so you tend to ask how, how does it lead to predictable results, but yet you need some kind of a model from which to derive the theory. Uh, and this is never given directly. I mean, that's sort of a leap of imagination to, to picture it in any, any way. And it's not a literal picture. It's a, it's a kind of a symbolic picture. And I think the same, a little bit of the same thing in religion, that uh, uh, you have to uh, take a little bit of a leap and, and use more than one model, perhaps. In, in religion, you've got personal models of God and you've got impersonal models of God. 
in, in physics, you've got wave models mm -hmm. of an electron, and you've got uh, particle models, and you you don't quite fit them together, but uh, you have to use different models in different situations. Well, and never fully grasp what you're what you're trying to understand. If we look for similarities in 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 constructing imaginative models, a wonderful term. It really, the human consciousness, the human mind, the human investigatory process is is fundamental to both. So that's the, the commonality, and it tries to apprehend what it knows from physical information about an electron mm -hmm. and what it, it believes or senses or sees revealed or whatever right. about God. I think there's a much greater kind of testability in the uh, case of, of physics, let's say, sure. uh, never complete, and in physics you've always got this fuzziness they call the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the unpredictability. But you can, you can achieve a degree of testing that you simply can't in religion. I think there is a critical reflection about religious experience that is a kind of testing, but it's never, it never leads to any kind of complete certainty. And, uh, I think you perhaps have to rely on a greater variety of models, uh, and certainly as you look around the world, there are there have been a very great variety of conceptions of God, and one's got to recognize that we 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 only can refer partially and symbolically, and try to bring it to interpreting our own experience, but realize one has only achieved a very partial understanding. This is a very important point because a significant difference in application, although not necessarily in theory as you describe it, is that in science, every scientist knows that every theory, every experimental result is subject to further refinement or, or, or refutation. Whereas in religion, there is a tendency among most believers yeah. to firmly believe that if they believe, that's it, and it is firm and final and resolute and, you know, my way or the highway, as they say. And perhaps if we think with your concept of imaginative models, the religious side can be a little bit more flexible in their continuing knowledge. I think one, one has to realize that science, of course, is always subject to re revision. But so is theology, and, and I think uh, there's much more change in the course of history uh, than people realize. Different languages, uh, uh, conceptual structures, uh, and if you, if you look at early Christianity, Middle Ages, where Greek thought came in, and different uh, terms were communicating to people, and to communicate today, one certainly needs different symbols, different language. Uh, and I think uh, one has to be open to revising, uh, perhaps uh, even classical doctrines to some extent. And if you're right that the religious community resists this, and, and I think it does take a, a degree of openness and perhaps of dialogue between religions to understand things that perhaps have not been part of one's own experience, but that are symbols in another culture. And also, of course, in religion, it's always tied in with other aspects of life, with rituals that express these ideas, with ethical commitments that become, because religion is a way of life, and doctrines and theology are only a small part of that. If you look at many of the religions as they exist today, you can point to a period of time where the beliefs of that religion became um, uh, fixed or, to be a little pejorative, became ossified. And they were never at the beginning, they were always at a time after the first founders did it. Yeah. But at a certain time, those beliefs became ossified. And then those beliefs became so embedded in the social structure that those who would disagree with it were ostracized or disfellowshipped or whatever the mechanism yeah. was. Yeah. And today you have these pockets of rigidity in religion. What you're bringing to it is a new way of thinking with your imaginative models. Though I think, uh, I think throughout history, many theologians have recognized that when they talk of God, they have to use symbolic language that cannot always be interpreted literally. Some more conservative groups try to 
insist on a lot of literalism in the language that's used about God, but I think a certain humility that becomes both a, yeah. the scientist and the theologian in making claims about reality that may be beyond what they're capable of supporting. You know, humility is a wonderful term because uh, scientists are, are, are forced to be humble because the results of the physical world overwhelm sometimes their theories. Yeah. Um, the religious community should be more humble in terms of their, their ethics and their morality, but sometimes they, they don't feel so humble in the confidence in their beliefs. And as world religions come into contact with each other, as we do these days with the communication and with cultures mixing, and uh, I think to try, to try to approach another religious tradition to ask what one can learn from it, rather than trying to attack it as one's first uh, move. I think that's a very important, and to realize that people's experience may differ and lead them into different paths. But I find some common elements in religious traditions across the world, particularly in the meditative and mystical, uh, the side of personal reflection uh, in different cultures, but also even in the some common core in ethical assertions, the primacy of, uh, of love in human relationships, of justice in society. I think there is some degree of, but what I've got, got to say, people do see uh, ultimate reality very differently. Perhaps it's like a mountain where nobody sees the top and people see different slopes from down uh, the depths below and, and can be a little bit humble that they alone are seeing the top. Uh, well, he, here's where science and theology may play a major role because science is universal. Every culture accepts that. Mathematics is a common language for mankind. And therefore, to the degree that each religious tradition embeds science and the science and theology dialogue within their own tradition, would be the degree that they would see more commonalities with each other. I think that's a very powerful and interesting uh, observation. I've been in the last five years in a number of conferences with scientists from a diversity of religious traditions. And often, I think because of their background as science, they're more open to each other. You put theologians together and they're often uh, starting off trying to attack each other. I think the, uh, there was a very interesting meeting in, in Spain, for example, of Islamic, Jewish, and Christian scientists respecting each other as scientists. And I think perhaps their, their background in science made them a little more humble and in, in, in a little more open to each other. But there were some very interesting uh, discussions among that group about ideas like creation, uh, ideas about the nature of the world and about human nature too because we each tradition has a framework within, within which it tries to understand human nature and the sciences certainly also study human nature and uh, in the course of that dialogue some fascinating discussions. Well in a world where discussions between religions are often not uh, as constructive as we'd like uh, the advent of uh, science and theology as a discipline, uh, I believe, is a very hopeful sign. It is indeed, right.